what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? We've been going through this. I tell you, I think I'm going to put this slide up here for the next two or three weeks until we finish this. What is the gospel? I've been thinking a tremendous amount about this. I wake up thinking about it. I go to bed thinking about it. I drive down the road thinking about it. Just more and more ways to clarify what it is that we're talking about. I mean, we've been Christians for decades, but there's always something to learn in this, in this topic for sure. So three definitions as we've seen. The saving message. What is the good news? Gospel, evangelion means good news. But what is the good news of the scripture? And the good news is the saving message or the news about Jesus Christ that must be believed in order for a person to be saved from the penalty of Adam's sin. Uh, Adam's sin. When you say, I'm saved, the thing that you're saved from is Adam's sin. You don't have the penalty that God levied on Adam. This eternal separation from God has been lifted from you. You're saved from having to go to the lake of fire forever and be separated from God. That's what you're saved from. The gospel is objective and it's a, it's a historical message based on fact and real things. A message of what God has done to freely save us from His justified wrath. What did we face? We've, we faced the wrath of God as unbelief. We faced sins that weren't accounted for, weren't forgiven. And we didn't have eternal life. So what is it that we get through this set of facts, the gospel, this historical message of Jesus Christ, that God lifts His justified wrath, that He's able to forgive us for our sins because He poured them out on Jesus Christ. And through our faith, He's able to provide us with eternal life. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And the last one, it's the true story of the lifting of Adam's penalty made possible through the death, burial, and resurrection of the last Adam, Jesus Christ. We ended here last time with, with this question, how does the Bible say? How does the Bible say a man is saved from Adam's penalty? And we went to Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31. Remember, this is the story of Paul and Silas in a Philippian jail. In the morning, the jail has been uh, torn asunder by God by an earthquake, some sort of disturbance God caused there in Philippi. And the jail is such that you could just walk out of it. When the jailer realizes that his, his life is not in danger anymore physically, that the Romans are not going to kill him because the prisoners have not escaped, the jailer turns to more important topics and he asks the question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So what is it that an unbeliever has to do? What is it that this Philippian jailer, what's his responsibility? I've heard through the night what you've said about what Jesus did. What do I do to make that story that you told effective for me? What must I do to be saved? And the answer was believe. Believe. That was it. Believe the story. Believe the proposition that I've given you to be true. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. We looked at the word believe, pistuo or pistevo. And uh, we looked at several definitions of it, all very closely related to believe in, to rely upon. I mean, what does it mean when you ask somebody who's in unbelief, when you ask them to believe in Jesus Christ, to believe the propositions about Jesus and about sinning men that you've told them, what is it that it means to believe? It means to believe in or to rely on, or to rely upon, to trust in, or to have faith in. And this is my favorite. It means to trust a proposition to be true. Remember, to unbelief, we give the proposition that you're a sinner in need of a Savior, and Jesus is that Savior. Believing in Jesus can lift the penalty of Adam's sin that God the Father has on you. It lifts the wrath of God from you. It forgives you of your sins, and it gives you eternal life. If you believe that proposition to be true, then you're trusting in it. You are believing in it. So even mentally, before a person says a single word that you might want just to make sure they understand the gospel and that they truly have believed, you may say, well, now in your own words, would you just tell God the Father that you're believing in His Son? 
But the Father knows our thoughts before we have them. The Scripture says, I know what you need in prayer before you ask it. The Father knows before anything comes out of our mouth what our thoughts were. So even before someone speaks an audible word to a man, God the Father knows the moment in which mentally He has placed His faith in Jesus Christ. So believing, I also, we went over this a couple of weeks ago. I just want to mention this again. Because sometimes people say that you just have to believe, you just have to have faith. And so I put this slide together to show that there has to be something that you're believing in. Belief and faith has to have at least two parties. Number one, he who is believing. That's your unbelieving friend who you've given the gospel to. You're asking them to believe a proposition. But there has to be something that they are having faith in or that they are believing in. And that's the object. He who is being believed in. In this case, it's Jesus Christ. Uh, if sometimes things happen and the answer that you get from friends who really don't know what to say is you just got to keep the faith. You just have to believe everything will work out. And I don't know what that means. It doesn't mean anything to me. There has to be an object to our faith. If you're going to tell me, keep the faith, give me a Bible verse. Give me encouragement from the Word. Let the Word build me up. Let God's Word build me up and encourage me. Don't just say, Rick, have faith. Well, I'm trying, but obviously I'm hurting. So give me something. And I'll give you something. I'll, I'll lead you to Jesus Christ and the Word of God. Faith has to have an object. Belief has to have an object in which we're believing. To believe this proposition, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Well, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. To believe means we are believing, trusting, relying upon something or someone. You believed, I've heard it, it's trite, but you believed when you sat down in that chair tonight that that chair would hold you up. You surely wouldn't have sat down in that chair and put your whole body weight on it and let yourself fall into the chair if you thought it was going to crumble and you were going to fall to the ground and hurt yourself. You had faith that that chair would hold you up like it's had every time you've sat in it. The proposition is that that chair is strong enough to hold you up again tonight. And every one of you had faith when you sat down in it. The object of the faith was the chair. The object of faith in, in salvation is Jesus Christ, but there has to be an object. You can't have faith in nothing. You have to have something or someone that you're placing your faith in. So if you tell somebody you just have to have faith, give them a promise of God. Give them something that they can hold on to, that you're not alone. God will never leave you or forsake you. Hebrews 13 says that. Give them something to hold on to. Give them Bible. Give them God's Word to hold on to in times of trouble. you got to have faith. doesn't push anybody closer to God. There has to be an object in order for belief to work. In order for belief to be definitionally belief, there has to be an object. You have to be believing in something, someone, some proposition. We have to place our faith in something or someone or else it is not belief. So believing, you just have to believe. You have to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, your sin bearer, who was crucified, buried, and resurrected. That's what you're believing. And that because of that, the wrath of the Father is, is lifted from you. Your sins are forgiven eternally and you have eternal life. That's the whole package. That's what you're believing in. So what is the object, the thing that we believe in? What is the object we believe in for salvation, for being saved from Adam's penalty? What is it? A someone or a something. What is it? It's Jesus. It's Jesus Christ. It's Jesus of Nazareth. It's the objective, historical message about this man that God sent to earth to save us from our sins. He's never sent another man to earth that could save us from our sins. He sent Jesus, the Lamb of God, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ. I ask this question as we keep going forward. Does it matter 
We know what the gospel is. So my question now is, does it matter if we distort the gospel a little as long as the main message is intact? Does it matter if you add something to the gospel? Does it matter if you mess it up a little bit? Maybe change it to suit uh, a situation, a need, uh, does it matter if you mess with the gospel? Can it be distorted or does it have to stay in its purest form, the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in order to save the world from their sins? You cannot distort the gospel. Look at what Paul said. We've seen this recently in the book of Galatians. Look how strong he gets with this. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 9, Paul tells the Galatians who are slipping in their gospel message because they're letting Jews come in and add the keeping of the Mosaic law to the gospel and add the, give it, the, the Mosaic law to the Christian life, both to salvation and to sanctification. The Galatian church is guilty of this, and Paul says, I'm amazed. I am blown away. I'm shocked that you're so quickly deserting Him who calls you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. What does he mean by that? We've gone through this. The fact that he says it's not another is because there is no other gospel. There's only one saving message. There's only one good news message in the book concerning how Adam's children go from death to life, and that's Jesus Christ his crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. You can't add to it. And that's what's going on in Galatia. So Paul says, I'm amazed that you're so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ as if to adopt a different gospel. Even if Jesus is the center of the gospel, to add yourself into the plan of salvation at all, he says, is to desert the Father who called you by the grace of Christ. It's a desertion of God, according to Paul. Strong language. You think there's a different gospel, but there's not. And Paul's message is, there's only one. He says, you're going to a different gospel, which is really not another gospel, as if there were such a thing, as if there were two ways to heaven, but there's not, there's one. Only there are some, and we're talking about the Judaizers, who are disturbing you, want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, Paul says, even if we who come into town who are the apostles of Jesus Christ, even if we start going off on our message, even if we or an angel from heaven, if God sends an angel who tells you a different gospel, even if we or an angel should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Is this thing on at all? <clears throat> so what's Paul's solution for the uh, adding to the gospel, distorting the gospel, changing the gospel at all? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ is what Paul said. He was asked a question and he answered it. What must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. To add anything to that, according to Paul, is a desertion of God the Father. It's a desertion of the grace of Christ. And he says, you should be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man, any man, in any place, in any church, at any time, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. Paul's intention was that the gospel of Jesus Christ be kept pure. No additions, no extra language, no baggage. Believe in the, in the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ because that's what he received according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That's what he preached to the Corinthians. And the Galatians received this message from Paul. <clears throat> and he said, if anybody goes off of this, let him be accursed. 
Accursed is the Greek word anathema. You, you hear this word. We still use this word from time to time, anathema. <clears throat> and it means in Paul's, in Paul's writing here, let him be cursed of God, by God. So Paul says, if anybody... So listen to who Paul is accursing here. Paul is calling down a curse on the people in the Galatian church who are teaching the adding of the Mosaic law to salvation, to faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul is calling on God here, let them be accursed. Let them be cursed by the God who I serve and bring the truth to you from. Strong language concerning how Paul and thus God the Holy Spirit intends for the gospel to remain pure. Strong language. Let him be accursed. Let God himself curse the man who changes the simplicity of God's childlike message, believe and be saved. <clears throat> Distortion of the gospel. Look at this in Acts 4, verse 10 and 12. 10 to 12. It says, let it be known to all of you. Listen to the giving of the gospel here. What's included in the gospel message? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. What's the gospel? According to Paul, the crucifixion, burial, of resurrection. Well, somebody can't raise from the dead unless they're dead. The burial is, is an easy one to include by the crucifixion and God raising someone from the dead. But the gospel in its simplicity is right there. Jesus is the object. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is a man. He's the one from Nazarene. And what did He do? But He was crucified for you. And what happened after that? God raised Him from the dead. By this name... Peter is making a, de a defense for himself. By this name, this man stands here before you in good health. Peter went into the, the city of Perga, I think it was, in Acts chapter 4. <clears throat> and there was a man there that they had taken out to the beautiful gate every day. He'd been lame from birth. And they took him out to the gate. Some of his friends obviously helped him to get there so that he could go there and beg for alms, beg for, beg for money, beg for food, beg for things to be given for him. And one day Peter and his entourage were coming through, and Peter, seeing the man begging, squared the man up, looked him in the eye, and he said, I don't have any gold and I don't have any silver, but what I have I'll give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. If you keep reading that story, it says, by his faith he was saved. That, that's this story. So Peter's now being questioned. How is it and by whose authority did you do this? And he said it was, through, it was by the name of Jesus Christ that this man is healed. I didn't do anything. I called on Jesus, the name of Jesus Christ, of, Na of the Nazarene, the one who you crucified, who's resurrected. It's by this name that this man stands here before you in good health. He, speaking of Jesus Christ, is the stone which was rejected by you. Bitter pill. Again, when you give the gospel, do you have to wait a few weeks, get to know him, uh, take him out to dinner, invite him to your house, build rapport? How did Peter do it? Man, this is an this is issue of life and death. If I walk away from here after giving you the gospel and you think I'm, a, I'm dirt, fine. This is an issue of life and death, eternal life and eternal death separation from the Father. Peter didn't worry about stepping on people's toes. It, this is loving language. It's just, it's just to the point. Jesus is the stone which was rejected by you. The builders, you the builders, by which, uh, but which became the chief cornerstone. And then what does he say about the purity of the gospel and the addition of anything to the gospel? L listen to this statement. You've heard this verse over and over. Peter says, and there is salvation in no one else. Who does that include? 
you and me. Salvation comes through Jesus Christ the Nazarene. Not by, any, not by anything anyone else can add. No one. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. You can't include your name in that. If anybody thinks that you believe in Jesus and you do good works, you've trampled on the name of Jesus Christ. This is His ground. He's the Savior of the world. And there's no other name that can be added to His name in salvation. So salvation is about the God-man, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, the God-man, is about salvation the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. And to add anything to the pure and simple gospel, gospel excuse me, is to invade a space that belongs to Jesus Christ alone. There is no other name. Rick, do not add your name. Jesus. And that's it. No other name. Not Jesus plus you, Jesus plus her, Jesus plus them. Jesus plus no one. Jesus Christ the Nazarene is the name, the only name that's ever been given under heaven whereby men must be saved. So you can't pervert this. You can't add your own name in salvation at all. Believe and do good works. We're going to move to this quickly. We're going to cover a couple of the fallacies now the distortions of the gospel that have been prevalent since Paul's day, because Paul speaks of these things. <clears throat> and I think probably highest on the list is when you ask somebody, a non-church person, uh, what, what, how do you get to heaven? If that's the question you ask, how do you get to heaven? Almost without question, most people are going to say, well, you have to be good. You have to live a good life. And if you drill down after that and say, well, what do you mean do, you have to be good? Well, you have to do good things. You have to do good works, right? That's what they mean by you have to be good. And then sometime in the future, they envision some judgment where all men are before God and one at a time, God says, God weighs their good deeds and sees whether their good deeds have outweighed their evil deeds and says, okay, you can come in, but you have to go to hell now. And I'll guarantee you the bulk, of, the bulk of the world thinks that that if they think at all that there's a God and that you're saved, the bulk of the world would probably answer like that. you got to do good and just hope that at the end of your life you've done more good than bad. Peter says that salvation is through the name Jesus Christ and that you can't add any other name to it because there's never been another name given. So how is it that, that this person would walk up to God on judgment day that, that doesn't exist, this judgment say, and say, here, this is Rick King's pile of goods. Please evaluate me. There is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. If you, if you know these verses, if they just slip off your tongue, you can go to this and you can show them this verse right here excludes you from, the, from your plan of salvation. You can't add your name to Jesus's. So the first one of these we're going to look at is to believe and do good works because a lot of people think that to be saved, you have to not only put your faith in Jesus, but you have to do good works, whether it's in the Catholic church, through the sacraments, no matter what church it is, it's the do good works. The question is, who does doing good works add to the gospel? Whoever's doing the good works, it adds you, it adds me, it adds the unbeliever you're giving the gospel to. You have to wipe that out of their minds. Let me give you a couple of verses here. Oh, Jesus the Nazarene and no other name. I forgot I underlined him. Look at Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Well trampled ground by the Christian. Very, very clear. Not works. Faith, belief. 
By grace, we just covered this recently in one of our sessions, by grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith, the Greek word pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S. It's the same word for pistevo that's, that's translated believe. Faith and believe are from the same root, this pistis. For by grace and undeserved, remember grace means something that you don't merit, you don't deserve, you don't earn. By God's grace, we have been saved through faith. The other thing that people like this don't get is look, look at the tense of the word saved. Perfect tense in the Greek. Past completed action with ongoing results. Perfect tense. Past action. You have been saved through faith. So how can you say that one day you hope you get to God and you give Him your pile and you hope the good outweighs the bad? On earth, you can know whether you're saved or not. Because Paul tells the Ephesians, in the past, through your faith in Jesus Christ, you believe and you stand, you stand as believers today. You are saved your faith has ongoing ramifications for you. In this case, eternal. You're saved forever. Have been saved. Past completed action knocks out the Catholic Church entirely because they believe that when they read this verse, that the church, the Catholic Church, is the one that gives out the grace and gives out the faith, and little by little, through the keeping of the sacraments, one day, hopefully, when you get to heaven, you've done the sacraments enough, you've attended enough of the masses, masses, their Sunday service, and God weighs you, and you've been in the church enough that they've given you enough grace that God saves you. Heresy. I mean, just heresy. This is what, give me, give me just a second. This is the kind of thing that when Martin Luther looked at the Catholic Church as a Catholic priest, looked at the practices of the Catholic Church, and then started reading the Bible for himself, this is the kind of thing that made him puke. How has the Catholic Church had this hold on us to think that somehow the church is the authority in the world and not the God of the Bible. And Martin Luther chunked the church and said, the Bible, the Bible is the authority. This is God's written word, and all you people are going by is your traditions. And Martin Luther said, sayonara to the Catholic church, and started the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, because of verses just like this. The Bible says that God gives the grace. By the grace of God, you have already been saved through your faith, and it's not of yourselves. So you can't add anything to the Bible because there is no other name under heaven, right? It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's freely given. It's not earned. It's not worked for. It's not merited. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. So if you have someone who thinks you got to do good things, take them to these verses. Take them to these verses and show them from the Word. Don't just speak the Word. My goodness, if you have a Bible, I think one of the more powerful, powerful things to do is say, friend, would you read what it says right there? You read with your own mind. You process with your own eyes and the mind that God gave you. I'm asking you to read that verse right there. Just read it out loud. Let's, let's, let's listen to it together. Carry that book around. If you can't carry it around, carry it around up here. But give them... The, God says in the Bible this, not good enough. God says in the book of Ephesians that Paul wrote to a church this. Land them in the Scripture because a lot of people say a lot of things. Oh, the Bible says this. No, it doesn't. Show me the chapter and the verse and we'll continue the conversation. But the Bible doesn't say anything about those seven sacraments that you've got. You can't find those in this book. So don't tell me what the Bible says unless you show me chapter and verse. What does it, what does it mean to work? 
not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works. Works is the Greek word ergon, E-R-G-O-N. We get our word energy from this. Mixing that, those letters up a bit, ergon is the word for work. It means a deed or an action or work. So we're talking about something that the unbeliever, the Ephesians unbeliever, the Ephesian unbelievers, go back to the time before they were saved. What Paul is saying is, you, I didn't bring you the message of salvation by your deeds and by your works. I gave you a message that through your faith in Jesus Christ, belief in the proposition of Jesus of Nazareth, His crucifixion, His burial, and His resurrection, I brought you that message, and you put faith in that message. You believed it. You believed the proposition to be true, and you were saved at that moment. It had nothing to do with works. It's not the gospel. It's not faith in Jesus plus works. And I'm telling you, that's where most of the world, if they'll, if they'll give God a listen at all, that's where they're stuck. Got to do good works. Titus 3, 5, another very, very clear passage about working in the Scripture, of working for salvation. What does it say, Titus 3, 5, and 6? He saved us. Stop right there. Who saved who? He God saved me. I had no part in that. Even if you put a period after that, if you just understand language, that's enough to prove the point. God saved man. Man doesn't do anything to, to save himself. God saved man. But he goes on, Paul writing the letter to his pastor friend Titus, and he says... God saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. Very, very clear. Not on the basis, ergon, the word deeds. I don't know why the Bible does this. Maybe it sounds more poetic, why they change their, it's the exact same Greek word, ergon, that, that in the other writings of Paul, it was translated works. Here they translated it deeds, exact same word. God saved us not on the basis of our works, which we have done in righteousness. But on what basis then did He save us? If it wasn't my works, then what, on what basis did He save us? And He answers it, but according to His mercy. Because what man deserves is to be separated from God forever. That's the penalty to Adam when he bit the fruit. And me as Adam's child... That's, that's what I inherit from Adam. I inherit separation from God forever. But God's mercy, who said, I'm not going to give you the penalty that's due you if you'll simply believe in Jesus by this grace gift, I'll give you eternal life. Not by works. God saved us not on the basis of works which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy. Just to finish it, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Believe and do good works? No. That's not what the Scripture says. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 don't say that. Titus 3, 5 and 6 don't say that. Not by works. Not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. What about this one, a crowd favorite? Believe and keep the Ten Commandments. Just, let's just go to the Bible. Let's go straight to the Bible. If you believe and you add the Ten Commandments, or if you believe that to be saved, you have to believe in Jesus Christ, His work for you on the cross, but you also have to keep the Ten Commandments or else you don't get saved, who does that add to the gospel? You, me, look what the Bible says. This is the best work. This is the best verse for this in all of the Scripture. Galatians two sixteen. Because Paul doesn't say it once in this verse, and he doesn't say it twice in this verse. He says it three times in this one verse. Because the Galatians were buying the lie, right? Why would you? Why would you say it so much to the Galatians? 
because the Galatians were buying the satanic lie that circumcision, other parts of keep the days, remember the days, the months, the seasons, the years, they were buying the lie that to be saved you had to believe in Christ and keep the works of the law. So Paul comes in with a sharp pen and he says, Nevertheless, knowing... See, this is something that's been learned. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, that's the Mosaic law, but instead he's justified through faith in Christ Jesus. What is justification? Remember, that's that split second when you believe in Jesus Christ and God the Father declares you righteous. It's a declaration of the righteous. As God looks at you and says, righteous. He clothes you with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You are justified at a split second in time. And Paul says, that didn't happen. God did not declare you righteous because you kept the Mosaic law. God declared you righteous at the moment you put your faith in Christ Jesus. And you should be able to put a period after that and say, that's clear enough. And Paul goes on and he says, even we, even the apostles, face to face with Jesus Christ for a time, even we have believed in Christ Jesus. Oh, so everybody has to believe in Jesus. Exactly. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we, the great ones, the apostles, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. The apostle lifting himself up, if anyone should be justified by the works, maybe it's the apostolic crowd. Maybe the apostles are good enough. No, even we placed our faith in Jesus Christ so that the Father would justify us by our faith in Christ, not by our works of the Mosaic law. You see? That's the second time he said it. And as if he said it enough, he does it again. He says, since by the works of the law, no human, no flesh, no human being will be justified. By the keeping of the Mosaic law, you foolish Galatians, no flesh will be justified. God will never, ever, ever declare anyone righteous. And make no mistake, if you don't have absolute righteousness, you don't enter heaven. You need forgiven sins, you need righteous, the righteousness of God, and you need eternal life. And no one will ever be declared righteous by any work of the flesh. By any work of the Mosaic law, no one will ever be declared righteous. Isaiah 64, 6, you know the verse? Even our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. Doesn't matter what the filthy rags are, just take my word for it. Even your best. That's Isaiah 64, verse 6. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. It just doesn't compare to the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It's as simple as that. It doesn't compare to perfect God becoming perfect man, paying the perfect price that God the Father levied against sin on the cross. Your good deeds, my good deeds, they're nothing. They just don't compare, that's all. So by no works of the law, by no work of any human flesh where God will God ever say, that's good enough, that's exactly what I wanted out of, you, out of you, you can come to heaven. Look at what Paul says, even we the apostles have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Jesus Christ. So if you want to point your finger at anybody, oh, but he was so good. You go to, you, you hear of someone's death. Were, were they a believer? I don't know, but he was just such a good man. My question is does it matter? No, he was pleasant to be around, but 
it, it doesn't matter because there's no work of the law. There's no work of the flesh. There's no good deed that will ever get a man justified. Paul says, believe in Jesus and be justified. Look at these verses. Acts chapter 13, verse 38 and 39. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren. Again, something that's learned. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God has to be heard, has to be believed, has to be applied, has to be thought through. It's learned. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through Him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through Him, everyone who believes... Now listen to this verse. Everyone who believes, not works, believes, is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. But I thought keeping the Ten Commandments was a sure, surefire way to heaven. What does Acts 13, 38 say? Just the opposite. The keeping of the Mosaic Law couldn't free you from anything. How do you earn forgiveness of sins? You don't earn it. It's a gift. You can't earn it. You can't clean up your act, whatever your act is, enough for God to say, okay, that's what I wanted. I'll, I'll declare you righteous, as righteous as my son. You hear the blasphemy when you say it like that. I'll declare you righteous by your own works. You're as righteous as Jesus Christ was. You hear just how blasphemous it becomes when you say it out loud like that. Forgiveness of sins, which is needed to get to heaven, everyone who believes. Everyone who believes in Jesus Christ. You could not be freed by the works of the law. It's not what the law was for. Acts 13. Look at this one, Romans 3.19. Galatians, I've told you many times, is a mini Romans. Look at what Paul said to the Romans 3.19 and 20. Now we know. I love, listen to the way Paul speaks to these people. Three times he's brought up justification by faith, forgiveness of sins by faith, and each time he says this, it's a learned word. You know this. You know this. You know this. It's been taught. He just won't let them up. It's not my belief. You know this because I've taught it and you know who I am, an apostle of Jesus Christ. That would have been Paul, Paul's words. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. We're talking about adding the Ten Commandments to belief in Christ to be saved. That's a heresy. We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed, closed and all the world may become accountable to God, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in His sight. Sound like Galatians 2? By the works of the law, you come up to people, they say, how do you, you ask them, how do you get saved? What do you think about heaven? How do you get there? You keep the Ten Commandments. Would you, sir, would you please read? I'm just trying to, I just want you to read what the Bible says about this. Would you please read this verse for me right there? The works of the law will not get a single human being declared righteous by God. Not in his sight. It may make another man think you're a nice guy, a good man, a great neighbor, great co-worker, solid guy, wonderful father, faithful husband. Does any of that matter in salvation? No, it's exceedingly important in the Christian life. But the works of the law are never going to get you declared righteous in the sight of God. Faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. One more, Galatians 3, verse 11. Back to Galatians. Now that, now that no one is justified by the law, he just won't let him up in Galatia, will he? Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident. You may impress each other, but in the sight of God, like he just said, and before God, that impression is of no value because our righteous deeds, according to Isaiah 64, 6, are as filthy rags. 
So no one is justified. No one is declared righteous by the law before God. And that's obvious because look what the scripture says. The righteous man shall live by faith. You unscramble those words. Let me read it so I don't botch it. It's hard to get a botch out of your mind. The one justified by faith will live. That's what that statement means. The righteous man, the one justified by his faith, is the one who lives eternally. The righteous man shall live by his faith. The one justified by faith is the one who lives. So is it true that the gospel message in the Bible is to believe and do good works? No. Is it true that the gospel message in the Bible is believe and keep the Ten Commandments? No. No, it's faith. It's faith only. You can't add anything to the gospel of Jesus Christ without perverting it and distorting it. And if you distort the message, then what does Paul say? You should be accursed. Bring a, cur- bring a cursing from God down on that man, Paul says. Even an angel, even one of my apostle friends. If Peter comes to you, if John comes to you, if James, the half-brother of Jesus, comes to you and preaches a gospel message different than what I've given you, the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, I pray a curse on him that God would curse him. Got to keep this. Got to keep the gospel simple. Next time there are more. Next time we're going to wander into the world of believe and be baptized. The Church of Christ believes that, and I mean wholeheartedly. Believe and confess your sins. Repent from your sins to be saved. Invite Christ into your heart. Give your life to God. Make Christ Lord of your life. Come forward and pray the sinner's prayer. Got stacks of verses for each of them. We'll cover. We'll start covering another couple of those next week. Maybe two or three or four. Let's close in prayer.